Here I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. How it all began. Father, please help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. This, these verses are, are bigger than anyone can imagine. How, how God, how can we explain? You can't explain God. Look, a lot of people say, well, I just, I, can, I don't believe anything that I can't explain or that's not scientific. I don't believe anything that you can't prove by science. Well, you're a liar. Yeah. You believe a lot of things that you can't prove. Look, I, I, don't, I can't explain how that everything I eat turns into blood cells, fingernails, white blood cells, hair, and all that. But I don't starve because I don't understand it. Right? So we, we, we got people who are trying to explain God. You say, well, I, I believe in evolution. No, you don't. You believe in some college professor that had some kind of... The, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart... There is no God. The college professor that says in his heart, there is no God, has no brains. I, I'm just telling you, they don't believe in evolution. You say, oh, they believe in evolution. They believe what they want to believe. They don't believe in evolution all the way down the line. We got a couple of gentlemen here today that works at the Ford Motor Company up here in town. I don't think they believe in evolution. But if I believed in evolution, like these people believed in evolution, I would go up to the parking lot at Nick Nicholas Ford, put a tire, a couple of tires down in an empty place, and wait for evolution to take place, and come back tomorrow and pick up my car. <laughs> if I believed in evolution, I got a, I've got a bunch of old watches that are not any good for anything. I would put them in a shoe box and shake it all up like it and open it up and boom, I got a brand new watch. <laughs> These folks that say, well, we believe in evolution. No, you don't. You say you do, but in your heart you don't. And the reason that you say that there is no God is because you're a fool. That's what the Bible says. I didn't say, the Bible, I'm just repeating what the Bible says. So, God, the Bible says in Genesis, you say, well, I don't believe the Bible. Well, you're washed up. If you don't believe the Bible, I can't talk to you. The Bible says, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. It doesn't try to explain God. It doesn't try to reason. Look, it just says, in the beginning, God. Look, if you try to philosophize that, if you try to figure that out, you'll go nuts. Yeah. There are just some things that you have to trust and believe by faith. Amen. All of you do. Right. You go to Walmart, buy something, buy some groceries or whatever. You open up that pack. You open up that candy bar and eat it. You don't know if it's poison. You eat it by faith. You, you've driven your car over here by faith. You didn't, you didn't have any idea. You, you didn't think, well, unless you're, unless you're crazy. You're not going to, oh, I'm going to have a wreck. I better not get in the car and go up there. Look, I'm, I'm just telling you, these, these folks that want to shove this evolution stuff down your throat, they're fools. They're fools. Well, I don't even know if I'll get through this today, but we're going to try the Bible says, and, and Bill quoted this here in the Sunday school lesson. The Bible says, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. The disciples heard that. Which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the Word of life. Again, that person that denies the God of all beginnings is a fool. Well, what about creation, preacher? Genesis 1, 1. Let's go there. The beginning of creation. The beginning of creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
If you'll follow in verse 2, 3, 4, 5, and 7, you'll find some verbs there. Verse 1, created. Verse 2, moved. Verse 3, God said. Verse 4, God saw. God divided. Verse 5, God called. Verse 7, God made. And, and so forth. So the beginning of creation, where, where did all this, where, where did everything come from? God created it. I, I believe that. Now, if you don't believe that, that's fine. That's fine. I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. I don't believe the Bible. That's fine too. You don't have to believe the Bible. You can go out here lost without Jesus Christ, die and go to a hell that you don't believe in. The beginning of creation. John affirmed that. John said that was true. John, in fact, in John chapter 1, we, we quoted part of it. But let me turn there and read John chapter number 1 and verse number 1. John 1 and 1. All right, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Now notice what it says. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. John affirmed that. Peter acknowledged that. Peter said, wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Yes. God is a faithful creator. Every day the sun comes out somewhere. Every day the birds sing. Every day the flowers grow. Every day. What if God took his hand off of that? One writer said this, that if God would keep, take his hand off of the wind that blows for three minutes, that the entire earth would burn up. God keeps everything going, ladies and gentlemen. He holds everything together. He keeps things from flying apart. He can't keep people from flying apart. But, well, yeah, he can too. If you'll trust him, he'll keep you from flying apart. And so John affirmed it, Peter acknowledged it, and Paul accepted it. In Hebrews chapter number uh, 1 and verse number 1, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, just jot these down if you would. I'm just going to turn and read them, okay? Hebrews 1, verse number 1, God, who at sundry times and in a diverse manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. He made the worlds. So the beginning of creation was, we, we have to give that one to God. Amen? Amen. Well, sure. And then I think about the beginning of Christ. The beginning of Christ. Let me show you something. First Timothy, turn to First Timothy chapter number three. You say, you just got through saying that they have always existed. Well, I did say that, but let's go on. First Timothy chapter three, verse number 16. First Timothy three, verse number 16. All right, we ready? Verse number 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now look at the first statement there. God was manifest in the flesh. Has he always been manifest in the flesh? No. Was he manifest in the flesh the day that he was born in Bethlehem? The city of David, God was manifest in the flesh on that day. We call it Christmas Day. Yeah. But God has not always been manifested in the flesh. But he's manifested in the flesh. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. God was manifest in the flesh at Bethlehem in the city of David. Now, in Luke chapter number 2 and, Ma and Matthew chapter number 1. Now, remember uh, the Sunday before Christmas, we looked at those two chapters just going back and forth. But in Luke chapter number 2, you know what we call, uh, normally what we call the Christmas story. Look at verse 11. Verse 11. Now, we're talking about the beginning of the Christ. Now, look what it says. For unto you... 
For unto you, these angels, speaking to the uh, shepherds here, or to uh, uh, angel Lord came upon them and they were sore afraid. For, verse number 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. All right. Matthew chapter 1. Let's follow along here. Matthew chapter 1. Let's look at verse number 18. Matthew 1, 18. All right. Boy, it's good to hear those pages turn. I like that. I don't like people just take my word for it. I like people to look at the scriptures and say, take God's word for it. Amen. Now, verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus. What's the next word? Christ. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then jo Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared un unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her, that, didn't say he, didn't say it, it said that. What was that? That was that body. The body was conceived in Mary. Remember, God was manifest, manifest in the what? In the flesh. All right. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name, what church? Jesus. Jesus. I like that. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. What happened on that morning? God was manifest in the flesh and God was with Mary and Joseph. God with us. And by the way, God with, look, if you're saved, God is with you All the time. Look, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But, but I'm going to make a point here. Now watch. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took him to wife, and knew her not till she, came, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now I'm going to shock you with what I'm going to say. There is no Jesus in the Old Testament. There is no Jesus in the Old Testament. Now, don't get up and walk out. Hear me out. That's why we lock the doors, by the way. <laughs> the Son of God is found throughout the Old Testament, is found in the prophecies of the Old Testament, the prophecies of his first and his second coming is found throughout the Old Testament, but Jesus is the name of, the, of his humanity of his humanity, and as such, it does not appear in the Old Testament until his birth. God was manifest in the flesh, and, they, and, and, and he was told to, to receive a name, and that name was Jesus. So there is no Jesus in the Old Testament. Born to Mary will be a child who is 100% God, Emmanuel. God with us. Born to Mary is, 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 is a child that will be 100% man, Jesus, all in one person. So we have God and we have Jesus, we have deity and we have humanity all in one person, and that person is Jesus. Amen. Now, since he's a man, he can die. He did die, didn't he? Jesus did die for our sins. He can, but since he's a man, he can live a full, real human life. And he did. But since he is God, conceived of the Holy Ghost, he is without Adam's nature. And being thus, since he is a man, he can die. And since he's not from Adam, he can die for the sins of the whole world. Look, anybody related to Adam 
could not die for the sins of the world. But anybody who was related to Adam and his humanity and God could die for the sins of the whole world. So he's the God man, but his name was not Jesus in the Old Testament. His name was Jesus at the place called Bethlehem, the city of David. Mary provided the body. Are you listening? Mary provided the body. The Lord came to dwell on earth as a man in that body. So we have the beginning of the Christ. We have the beginning of creation. Well, let's look at another one. The beginning of the church. Now here's where I differ from some preachers. And I'm not going to argue about it or anything like that. Let's look at Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. I'm not here to argue anyway. I, you know, I learned that a long time ago. That doesn't accomplish a thing, does it? Acts chapter number 2. All right. You say, preacher, we're going we're to look at the beginning of the church. Well, okay. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. We're talking about beginnings today. I guess you kind of get the message, beginning of the year, beginning. Okay. That's real deep. Real, it, it was... <clears throat> Bible verse, verse number 41. Look at verse number 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There had to be a church in order to add to the church. So where did the church come from? Well, I, I thought about this. I live in a body. Duh. You guys live in a body. If, if you eat a, a, a delicious meal, I mean, it was, I, I mean, if you eat... Whatever. That what you eat does not become another body. It is added to your body. Right? How many of you know, <laughs> know what I'm talking about? Whatever you, whatever you eat is added to your body. It does not become a different body. Unless you're an alien that I just read about. As of standing on Walmart line, just looking at those. <laughs> Unless you're one of those. But anyway. In Acts chapter 2, we have the church already in existence because it was added to. Well, where did it start? Where did it begin? I think I know. In John chapter number 20. Let's go there. John chapter number 20. Verse number 22. John chapter 20, verse number 20. Well, let's look at verse 21. Jesus appears in the upper room. The door's being shut. He just comes in. He walks through the walls. He appears to them. And he says in verse, now this is strange. I think this is pretty good. In verse number 19, Acts, uh, John 20, verse number 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst unto them. Now look at them. They're in an upper room. They're in a room. And they're assembled together. Jesus had been crucified. Here he had been risen again on the third day. They're in an upper room. The doors are shut. No, no doubt they're, they're terrified. And then all of a sudden Jesus said, Peace be unto you. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, you're talking about shocking. And so he had to have peace. He had to tell them peace. He had to declare peace. Now watch. And when they had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them again, peace be unto you as my father hath sent me, even so send I you. Now watch this. And when he had said this, what did he do? He breathed on them. And saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, I personally believe, you may disagree, that's okay. I personally believe that's when the church started. Jesus 
breathed on his disciples and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. They had the Holy Ghost come upon them at times, but they were not, they had no, they never received the Holy Ghost like Jesus gave them just in that upper room. Now, what, why do you say that? Uh, because the breath of God, I want you to think about it. Let's go all the way back to Genesis. The breath of God is the life of God. God, the Bible says in Genesis that God took the dirt of the ground, the clay and all, and formed man out of the dust of the ground. Was he complete? No. Not without life. He was just a clump of dirt, shaped, formed. But then the Bible says that God did what? Breathe in his nostrils. The breath of what? Life. And man became a living soul. Look, whenever God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, he became an eternal living soul that will never die. 930 years later, Adam died, but his soul lives on. Yeah, amen. The breath of God gives life. What did Jesus do in the upper room to the disciples? I don't know if it was upper room, but it was in the room. He breathed on them. What kind of breath do you think he breathed? He breathed on them life. Look, they were just a bunch of dead religious guys until the Holy Ghost got upon them. Until they received the Holy Ghost. And then you're talking about a change in their life. Look, before they were arguing with each other, the disciples were arguing who's going to be the greatest and who's going, and let's kill these Samaritans and let's do this. Boy, after Jesus got a hold of them and breathed on them, they were living a different life. That's why I'm telling you, that's why I'm telling you, you can be religious. You can join every church. You can visit every church. You can read your Bible. Unless God comes in you, you're dead. Unless you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're dead. So look here. The breath of God is the life of God. In Genesis 2, 7, he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. Adam became a living soul. Let's go forward to Ezekiel chapter number 37. You don't have to turn there. But in Ezekiel 37, we have a valley of dry bones, the Bible says. And they're scattered and they're all over the place. And it is a picture of Israel without the life of God in them. And so what happens? The Bible says, the foot bone connected to the ankle bone and the ankle bone connected. Well, you know the song. And so these bones come together. They are formed. The sinews, the muscles, the, everything comes together. But there's a problem. They have no life in them. They were just like Adam before God breathed into, them the breath, breathed into him the breath of life. So, so here is these bones... The skin, the muscles, the sinews, all, all this stuff. They're, they're put together, but there's no life. And do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says in verses 8 through 10 that God's breath, he causes the wind to blow up on these bones. And guess what happens? They come alive. And they become a great army. I'm telling you, Israel without God was dead. God calls the wind the breath of God to give them life and they became a nation. The Bible says that the script, all scripture is given by, what's the word? Inspiration of God. God breathed is the word. We used to, we, have you ever heard the word aspire, A-S-P-I-R-E? Have you heard the word Inspire, that's what we're talking about. Well, you, you know what? When you go to the hospital, when you go some, and you, you ask for somebody, and the nurse or the doctor's trying to be formal, trying to be nice, kind, they don't just come out and say they're dead. They say they have expired. You have an expiration date on food. You have an expiration date on your license plate. You haven't, it's, it's, when, it's when the thing is over. It's when it ends. You know what the Bible says? That the, that the scriptures are given not by expiration, but by 
inspiration. I wish, he, I wish these bozos would leave our Bible alone. Because the, those, those uh, perversions of the scriptures in which they put out, they expire about three or four years and they have to make another one. <laughs> but the word of God, God gave us his word. It's God breathed. And that's, that's why this book is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than two, any two-edged sword. I'm telling you what, you say, well, I don't understand it. Well, you get born again, you'll start to understand it. When you let God's breath come in you, you will understand God's inspiration. Right. You'll understand what this Bible say. Well, so the, this gathering of the disciples in this room, God breathed on them and they had a life that they never had before. Now, in John 1 and verse number 4, John, where are we at now? Where did I leave you? I'm going to go to John 1, verse 4. Just read that, but look at it again. John chapter 1, verse number 4. All right. The Bible says, in him was life. In him was life. Everything that lives, lives because of Jesus. Everything that lives, lives because of Jesus. Look at John chapter 3. I think this is amazing. John chapter number 3. Let's go to chapter 3. Now remember he's talking to Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. And notice what Jesus said in verse number three. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Of course, Nicodemus didn't understand it. So he says, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say that he must be born again. Then look what he gives as an example. Verse 7. What does he give? The wind. How about that? What an amazing uh, uh, coincidence. No, it's not a coincidence. It's the word of God. God used breath to enter into Adam. God used the wind to enter to the nation of Israel. God says that scriptures are God breathed. And so he talks about being born again and he uses the wind. How about that? In other words, he's saying you can't get born again without the wind. The Spirit of God. You say, but I got baptized. Don't make no difference. You can get baptized and know every tadpole there is to know <laughs> in Citrus County. But that's not going to get you to glory. Well, let's move on. The beginning of creation, the beginning of Christ, the beginning of the church. What about the beginning of the Christian? Where does a Christian life begin? Well, I just read it to you in John 3.3. 3, Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The new birth is the beginning of the Christian life. Now, let me give you two things about the new birth. Number one, the Bible says that all things are become new. All things are become new. Therefore, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Something brand new, new creation. God doesn't remake you, he brings it new. Gives you a new life. New creature. Old things are passed away, he says. Behold, all things are become. Now, now, now I want you to... I, I want you to get this. The Christian life is a life of growth. You just don't, boom, I'm mature. I'm a mature Christian. Oh, you are. How long have you been saved? Well, I got saved yesterday. Well, you're not a mature Christian. And by the way, none of us reach, reaches maturity until we see Jesus as he is. And so when he says that all things have become new. Now look, I'm going to give you a deep statement. If you are, you said I'm saved. Well, let me ask you, let me say this. If you are what you were, then you ain't. <laughs> now that's bad language, but that's good. That's uh, good doctrine. <laughs> if you are right now, you said I'm saved. I'm right with God. If you are what you were, 
then you ain't. Amen. Right. If, if, you're not, if you're not been changed from what you were, you're not saved. Amen. You say, well, I used to be a drunkard, but I, I still like to drink. And I, still like, I used to be an adulterer, but I still like to... Well, you ain't. Right. Amen. You can say what you want to say. Faith without works is dead. Here's what I'm saying. That all things are become new. And then secondly... This life, this new life will become noticeable. They took knowledge of the disciples that they had been with Jesus. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the Bible says they were first called Christians in Antioch. Something about them, their life, caused people to say, those people are living like Jesus. And I'm just telling you, if you're saved, you have a beginning. You had a beginning as a Christian. That beginning meant a new birth. It meant a new life. And it meant a noticeable life. Yeah. I'm just not for this secret discipleship stuff. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Well, let me give you the last one. Matthew 24. Let's go to Matthew 24. We're talking about beginnings. Beginning in creation, beginning of, of the Christ, beginning of the church, beginning of the Christian. There's got one more here. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Verse number 3. Matthew 24, verse number 3. By the way, this whole chapter is taken out of context in some churches. They said, well, this is the, safe, this is the church. No, this, we're talking about Israel here. In Matthew 24. But look what he says. The church is gone at this point. The church has been raptured at this point. Look at verse number 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall, oh, we've, we've seen that. Charlie Manson said he was Christ, didn't he? He found out that he wasn't. <laughs> and, 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 and not too many people swallowed that uh, lie anyway. Maybe those women. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars. Are we hearing that now? And rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation. Is that happening? Yeah. Sure. And kingdom against kingdom. Well, look at our own government. The kingdom on one side is rising up against the kingdom on the other side, and they're lying, and they're conniving. They're, yes. They have sort of a kingdom, don't they? Well, look. Nation shall rise against nation. Yeah. Is that, is that happening? Yeah. Kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines. Is that happening? What about pestilence? <laughs> Are we seeing pestilence in our country? Oh, it would never happen in America. It's happening all over the world. And it's happening in America. Pestilence. Do you not know that this Chinese virus is pestilence? Well, it happened in China and somebody got... Look, God... God allowed this thing to happen. That's right. God allowed this thing to happen. And many good people die. Don't get me wrong. Many good people get sick. Many good people die. But God said in the last days these things would happen. Now watch. Earthquakes, we have that. In diverse places. Different places. Now look at verse number 8. All these are the what? Beginning. Beginning. Of sorrows. You said, Preacher, it's bad. It's just beginning. It's just beginning, ladies and gentlemen. You said, It can't get worse. It will get worse. Read the rest of the chapter. We, we won't have time to read that there. But we're looking at Israel and the world will go through great tribulation. Daniel said that it's, it's never been like this that before. And what takes place, it's never going to be like it used to. Uh, or like it has been before. Look, you think it's bad now? You say, we're in, a, we're in a new year now. Don't make any difference. This is the beginning of sorrow. 
The church is not here. If you're saved, if you're saved, you're looking at the beginnings of all this stuff. But God is not going to let his people go through what they're about to go through in this chapter. It's the, just the beginning of sorrow. Look, I'm glad I'm saved. I cannot stop this from happening. No government, no amount of legislation can stop this from happening. It's going to happen. It's already started. It's beginning. All these are just the beginning of sorrows. I'm glad I'm saved, Lou. How about you? I'm glad I'm saved. It's just beginning. It's going to get worse, but I'm gone. And you're gone too if you're saved. But if you've never been saved, this is just a picnic compared to what it's going to be. Yeah. Oh, it can't get no worse than this. All these people dying of the COVID. You know, it's amazing. Everybody's dying of COVID now. Nobody's dying of heart attacks or flu or diabetes or anything like that. It's all COVID. I hate that word, COVID. Chinese. It's where it come from. I'm just telling you that. Let's look one more. Let's look at Revelation 21. Let, let's look at one more new beginning. I, I'm ready for a new beginning, aren't you? Well, let's look at it. Let me get my glasses back out. I can't see. Revelation 21. Here's another new beginning. Are you saved? Say amen. All right, here's another new beginning. We haven't gotten there yet, but we're going to. Revelation chapter 21, verse number 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Here it is. Here's the new beginning. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, what a, what a beginning, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. You talk about a new beginning, we got one coming. We got one coming. But I had one a long time ago. When I, turned, when I was 14 years of age in a little Baptist church in Red Star, West Virginia, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I had a new beginning. And I read the last chapter, or what, next to the last chapter, I'm going to have another new beginning. Amen? Amen? And if you're saved, you got something to look forward to. But if you're not saved, your sorrow is just beginning. It's not going to get any better. Not going to get any better. Our Father, please help us. I pray, Heavenly Father, something said will grab a hold of some hearts today in this congregation. Father, if there's some here that needs to be saved, I pray that you'd save them. We ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.